Hi, Philip. It's great to talk to you today. Hey, Kira and Caroline. Uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. Yeah, a little bit about me. My name is Philip Evish. Um, I was born and raised in Frederick, Maryland. Um, it's about an hour west of D.C. where I'm currently living. I'm 25 years old, and in January 2021, I um, started a new job. Uh, it's titled Pathways Horticulturist at the Smithsonian Institute within the Smithsonian Gardens Museum. Pathways position is basically for recent graduates. Uh, in order to apply to be a Pathways Horticulturist, you had to be two years or less out from your undergraduate degree in horticulture, since it's a horticultural job. Did you always know what you wanted to do, like from early on, middle school, high school age? Definitely not. I was not one of those kids who had like one career goal um, that I wanted to achieve. I have noticed throughout my life that I've always been interested in a lot of different things. Um, at one point in middle school, it was like being an optometrist. Uh, then it went to being an architect. Then it probably went to psychology and journalism and history. And it was everything. And when I went to college, so I went to University of Maryland in College Park. And I started as a psych major and lasted that for about a semester. And I was like quickly realizing that it wasn't for me. I switched to journalism at that point because I was like, writing is fun and you get to explore a lot of different topics that you're interested in. And then I quickly learned that I also didn't want to do that. And the biggest question for me in college came about just food and healthy eating. Um, I grew up kind of not eating the healthiest and my health reflected that diet. And as like a 18 year old, I I was like, it's a, maybe it's about time that I take my health into my own hands. You know, I'm going into school, college, and um, maybe this is like a sign of maturity that I can like, you know, maybe lose some weight or not eat junk food all the time. And as I was pondering those questions, it really just came down to food is plants, like in its most raw form. And I was like, that's pretty cool. If like, if eating healthy means eating plants, what is it about plants that's so magical? And I really just wanted to get to the bottom of that question. And for me, just the logical way to turn was to study horticulture. I switched my degree my sophomore year of college, which I think for, for younger college students, I almost like encourage you to change your degree or like ask questions that are going to like kind of scare you. Because I, I found personally that when I was um, recognizing things that I didn't know, it made learning so much easier. Rather than having a career goal in my mind, like I want to be X, Y, or Z, and these are the like exact steps I need to take to get there. It was really just like, what do I not know? And like, what am I genuinely curious about? And that was horticulture. There's so much to do in horticulture. And I think like, as I discovered that as a student in college and doing internships throughout the process, I was like, wow, like I could easily do this for the rest of my life and never be bored because you can just do uh, so many things. Like I have so much respect for the liberal sciences and things that are more esoteric and philosophical. Like I spent a ton of class time in those types of environments as well. But to put in my summer internship experiences where I was managing a farm in D.C., um, Columbia Heights Green is a community farm, basically in a quarter acre in this abandoned lot in the heart of Columbia Heights. I was able to lead that farm for about two seasons in 2017 and then 2018. I, I graduated in 2018, so I was kind of doing both summers there. And really, it was just, it was a great opportunity to practice farming practice like leading a large group of volunteers because we could have anywhere from 10 to 50 volunteers per weekend uh, volunteer hour. And the cool thing about that farm was you don't have to be on a waiting list to show up and participate in the farming, which is a huge barrier to entry for a lot of community garden spaces. DC doesn't have a ton of parks. Obviously the National Mall downtown is a huge swath of public land but there isn't a place for you to grow anything 
And so these tiny quarter acre lots that the garden I was working was just really allowed a diverse mix of people to come. We could all work on a task together. You could just show up and anyone who came would just like divvy out the harvest equally among all of us. And it was a true like communal effort to get a lot done. And I just learned so much. And I was like, wow, like I could really do this. We could all be doing this in small scales throughout the city. But unfortunately, what I realized is people with that working knowledge of farming, agriculture, horticulture, it's such a small number of people. I mean, I graduated with, I think, six or seven people in my entire major. And so when you all even asked me to talk about this topic, I was really excited because now that I have been out of school for almost three years and I've been a practicing horticulturist for those three years in different capacities, I'm learning that like the need to train and like grab people's attention to study horticulture and to get involved in this like pathway is so necessary. Like I said, horticulture is massive in what you can find yourself doing. One summer I interned for a green roofing company in Arlington, Virginia. That in its own right, green roofing, was a really intense side to horticulture. And um, the nursery industry is a huge um, section of horticulture that I've only scratched. And the thing with horticulture, too, is like it is hard work. And I think that is what some people reasonably shy away from. I know for me personally, that's also why I love the career so much is because I have that passion for being outside every day. I almost don't know how I would function if I if I didn't. I mean, I just know myself and I couldn't work in, indoors or on my computer. And I think especially in the context of the pandemic when um, everything was shutting down, people had to go and work from home. It's like, I'm a gardener. We can't possibly work from home. When you were talking about your college experience, I heard you say that you asked yourself, what am I generally curious about? And that helped you figure out that pursuing this horticultural career was something you were interested in. Well, after you asked yourself that question, how did you approach searching for opportunities to help you pursue that career? And what resources did you use? I think at that point when I was switching my degree, I only had a curiosity um, I relied on like the college, you know, the, the agricultural college at University of Maryland is it's a land grant university. So they have networks of farmers and horticulturists and landscape architects and arborists. My, I was doing, working on my capstone project, it, directing my work towards like childhood obesity within, um, the college park area. And then that work resulted in me partnering with an elementary school and I established like a new after-school gardening program with a couple teachers in their third grade class. And it was just a matter of like, I was in a program that gave me the opportunity to connect with this local school. I identified their needs. And then while I was interested, in, I had this interest in horticulture, but I didn't know anything about it. And I kind of just dived into it. And I was like, I am ready to like take on this project and build a garden and like, I'll be learning with the kids that I'm going to be teaching that spring. Gardening is an act of doing. You can't read about gardening and become a gardener. And again, that's why I would say all of the times you can just involve yourself. I just looked around. I mean, I use Instagram pretty solidly as a way to network with gardeners and with institutions and learning about what small farm is doing over here and Maybe that seems like silly, but I don't think it is. I think connecting with people in a way that you can like just message a farm in, in a direct message or, you know, talk like talk to some botanist that you see who's working at Harvard, like the, the doors to entry to make connections with people in the field, um, I have found personally to be really just available. So in my in my degree at Maryland, there was this point when I started telling people, oh, I'm like a horticulture student. And then people would turn to me and like point to a tree or point to a plant and be like, oh, well, what's that? You study plants. And it was getting to be my senior year 
in this degree and I actually still wasn't able to identify things around me. And I think that plant blindness, which is a common term used in the field today, um, of just the general public not knowing the the ecosystem of native plants and, in, and invasive weeds that we live in and how complex that like relationship is um, for a million different reasons, but basically not having a context to walk around in our world. And I don't think that naming every plant in Latin versus a common name or whatever is better that like one isn't better than the other, but it's just, it, it's, it was forming a relationship with really anything around you. And again, as like that starting point. So if, if you know that like the one tree outside your window is an oak, then that is like the best place to start. So for me, when I finally had that identification course, it, it began to change everything about the rest of my career because I, sh I started to shift from agricultural food crops and developed more of an interest in ecology native landscapes and um, ornamental gardening. So when I, when I graduated, I took my first job in Hawaii working as a horticultural therapist. And that was an amazing opportunity to not only practice my um, gardening and like food crop production skills, but to do so with teenagers who usually usually the kids that I was working with had no outdoor experience. Some were addicted to their cell phones. Some had, you know, a lot of different traumas and why students were there was very variable, but traditionally all of them just had no experience outside. So working with those students was amazingly rewarding. And I learned so much about patience and how to make plants interesting to kids who wish to death that they were on their Instagram and their cell phones. And another fascinating part about Hawaii is 80% of their native plants are only found in Hawaii. Um, but unfortunately, invasive species have decimated and taken over so much of that native habitat. So when you look around, you're seeing palm trees and coconuts and mangoes and avocados, uh, bananas, all of these plants that we think of when we think Hawaii, but none of them are native, unfortunately. So I feel like every time I started moving forward as a gardener, I was equally steeped in the ecology of wherever I happened to be. Again, as a curious person, I'm like, if I move to California, the whole new plants and I could go to another country and I won't know anything you know, I could be the best gardener in the DC area and I go two hours south and it means nothing. I mean, that's just like how literally temperamental plants are and like they're only going to grow in certain regions. And that that challenge to me is just like so exciting. It's just and it again, it's humbling. It's such a humble field because when people do think they know everything, you can easily just be like, no, you don't. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> Definitely. Um, how did you find out about the opportunity in Hawaii that's so far away it just seems like a crazy place to, like right after college like an amazing opportunity but I'm just curious I worked for this like adventure program which was like a subdivision of our gym at Maryland and they would lead backpacking trips and biking trips for students um, on weekends and things like that and a couple of those um, folks had talked about the program and had recommended it and they were like this is like a great sort of right out of college thing there's a lot of young people involved and if you're good at facilitating and kind of holding space for folks then it's it's a nice um hard place to work it's it's up to you right like if, if you have the opportunity to be in college like i just you can't take that experience for granted college especially now is is a different reality um and life will just keep changing and so just be involved with what you do and like take real like curiosity in it for sure yeah that's definitely awesome. I mean that's how me and Kara even created this podcast because we had been working for Smithsonian Gardens since 2018 mm. 2019 um 
And we were supposed to be creating like educational projects to be in the museum for visitors to interact with. And we had to totally change up our entire like plan for the rest of our college career uh, to make something online. Um, so it's definitely tricky. But if you stick to it, like eventually we landed on something like this, which is amazing. But I totally agree. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, like I said, this is such a great idea. Um because I think people need to hear about the successes of horticulture and also just realize that there are a ton of jobs in this field. After Hawaii, I, I felt a little claustrophobic there and I was like, I'm going to move. And ironically, I moved to New York City, which is very small <laughs> <laughs> in size and a lot more people. So I don't know why I didn't address my claustrophobia, but I took the leap and moved there. Um, the New York Botanic Garden had hired me as an intern and I worked in their herbarium for the summer of 2019, I guess. Um, and the herbarium again was a, a totally new field for me, um, within plant science. And I took the internship because I was like, I don't know what this is. And I'm curious and it's New York city. So essentially the herbarium has nothing to do with, um, gardening or outdoor work. I worked inside their library, um, but you'd go out, collect a plant, literally dry it, and then paste it to a piece of paper with the, the plant name, who collected it, where it was, all the details. Um, so basically, in, at the botanical garden, they just have endless rows and filing cabinets of these specimens. And so my job that summer was take a folder of dried old plants and take a photo of the specimen. So basically I was just digitizing these sheets of dried plants. Um, and then I had the opportunity to write about plants and make the herbarium specimen seem cool and like try to tell different stories about different collectors and like women in botanical science and different queer artists, not artists, but um, queer botanists. And um, just, you know, telling stories through plants is another um, big, Part of my job uh, in a lot of different capacities. Plants are always ingrained with human society and civilization, and you really can't tell a story about people without the plants that have helped them um, through any context up until today. So I applied to New York Parks and Recreation and became a gardener. Um, I started in the fall of 2019 on the mobile crew from Manhattan and just, you know, I was pretty new to the city and I just got to drive around with a crew of gardeners and visit all these different parks throughout the city, um, do a bunch of weeding and mulching and pruning, just, you know, maintaining the huge number of parks in Manhattan alone. So I did the mobile crew for about three months and I guess I had kind of proved myself and they were like, we have a need for a gardener at City Hall, which was in lower Manhattan. And so they stationed me at City Hall and I worked there for a full year, uh, November 2019, basically through the entire pandemic. And I finished up there November 2020. Yeah, City Hall was an adventure. Uh, with everything that happened last year, the pandemic started and um, parks remained open. Gardeners still went into work and you know that was tough that was tough to not have a lot of guidance at the time and at first i like almost resented the garden and the park because i was like this isn't fair you know our safety isn't being taken into consideration right now um but then also like two weeks in i was like you know actually like i can use the garden as a space to just like ground out these feelings and um it really became like a place of solace for me. And then because it was the pandemic, not a lot of people were coming into the park. So it was an eight acre area and I felt like I basically had it to myself. And then last summer, the protesting that happened, there was actually a big um, protest encampment on the outside of City Hall. And so I was dealing with like the, the politics of that and a, a constant police presence, a constant protest presence the, my park being locked down almost every other day, if not for weeks straight. And here I am as like this gardener. Um, I'm like the one person that is just responsible for making it look great for 
essentially no one. I mean, for many weeks last summer, no one could come into my park. And I'm a public gardener. And that's like, why I do my work, or at least the time that's what I was doing. And it just, it, it really made you, it made me question myself. And it's like, is this the work that I value? Like, why am I putting in all this hard work if no one's going to see the poppies or the black eyed Susans that are blooming? In the fall, I was able to recruit a student intern from NYU. And she was like a uh, assistant gardener, essentially. She came three days a week and um, didn't really have any horticultural background she was a great support and I was really happy to work with a college student because I was you know I'm recently out of college and just to have that like relational like same level I guess um yeah she she worked with me in the fall and then by that time I had put in my application for this pathways Smithsonian um, gardening job like months before that and um, as HR takes its time you know I finally um, got accepted to that job in the fall and then transitioned out of New York City um, and back down to DC and moved here in December yeah and have been working I guess for about four months as a horticulturist with Smithsonian every museum has a curated garden space and i think right now as a new employee learning how smithsonian gardens differentiates themselves from the museums that everyone like knows and loves has been like a true difficult kind of um it's just yeah it's difficult to kind of parse that out you know i'm not just showing up to work every day just to prune shrubs it's you know, I'm, I'm researching, I'm learning plants, I'm thinking about what can go in some empty spaces and how they're going to play in with the other plants and the other themes. And you're a designer and you're working with color and truly like being a gardener and a horticulturist, you are an artist. My work is just how do I relate plants to people, even someone who thinks they don't care at all for a plant. There's a way to tie them back to something. Um, and I just see that as a challenge with like literally everyone I meet. And what a journey you've had. I'm just like floored by all of the opportunities that you have been able to do since graduating college. That's amazing. Yeah, I am really lucky. I rely on my instincts to guide me based on what I'm interested in. Like I, one of the big, it was hard to leave New York because I loved that city but what I knew was that coming to Smithsonian would be like going back to school, learning hands-on every single day from experts in the field. Um, everyone is gardening in a different style, has a different background. And then that alone, those connections are everything. I look around every day and I'm like, a lot of public spaces, they struggle to find gardeners. They struggle to find people to maintain their parks. These pockets of ecology really matter um because they they feed into like our rivers and our creeks and our woodlands and everything is connected whether we think so or not plants seeds everything can travel so fast it's also been so cool to hear you talk about all of the opportunities you've already been able to take advantage of when it comes to the horticultural field in high school i took a horticulture class and my we were lucky enough to have a greenhouse in that class mostly consisted of talking about like the basics of horticulture and what I mean by that is like propagating maybe grafting and that sort of thing and we just talked a lot about like native species I went to high school in Virginia and it was an amazing class because I loved plants and my teacher was awesome and he had previously been a landscaper and he's an arborist and that was really cool but in high school I was like okay well I love plants but like I don't want to be an arborist. <laughs> I love plants, but I don't really want to go be a landscaper. So it's so cool to hear you talk about all the other opportunities that can be had, like such as like a plant therapist. Like, yeah. what? I've never heard of that. <laughs> like, that's so cool, you know? And I think it's so important that people realize that because when I was in high school hearing horticulture, I was like, oh, like, okay, I have this image in my head of like an older man 
tending to a garden. Like, I just couldn't <laughs> see how that would apply to my life and my interests. But yeah. it can. It really can. And that's just so evident through your experiences. It's true. I, I When I was in high school, the horticulture classes were, like, co-run by the FFA, the Future Farmers of America. Mm-hmm. And as like a naive high schooler, I was like, FFA, that's like, I don't want to be a part of that. That sounds like silly or whatever. And I mean, here I am today as like a full-time gardener and there's so much creativity involved and yeah, just become gardeners. (laughs) (laughs) You're like really convincing me to like change my entire like college career. Here we go, Caroline. Like, let's go. I know, like Caroline and I are graduating in three weeks and we're like, oh, wait a second. (laughs) I'm like oh mad God. that AU doesn't have a horticulture program. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So like for people like Caroline and I right now, or maybe other people who are towards the end of their college career or who have graduated and they're hearing your story and are really interested in what you're doing, but haven't, they don't have a formal horticultural degree. Like what would you say to those people? Are there certifications available that you know of? Do you have to have a horticulture degree to do the work you're doing? I'd say first and foremost, no, you don't need a degree in horticulture. And I think that that was kind of a problem with me uh, when it came to applying to the Smithsonian because you do need a degree to be a horticulturist at Smithsonian. And that's okay, but I think it limits a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge from other capacities and other experiences. What I recommend to people is, yes, there are certificate programs. You can go to Brooklyn Botanic Garden, NYB or New York Botanic Garden. Those are two I'm most familiar with them living in New York City um, that offer, you know, 30 credit programs. And they're usually like a year and a half or two where they have like classroom and outdoor programming <clears throat> to finish the program with a certificate. You are a horticulturist that can stand in for a degree. If, if you feel an urge now to learn something new, I think it's just like engaging with the material. Look at things like it doesn't have to be this like program. It doesn't have to be this one set of skills that you're now a gardener. It's like we're none of us are gardeners unless we just like practice it and try it. Like mm-hmm. the amount of plants I've killed at my apartment, on my patio, in the <laughs> formal gardens that I'm responsible for. It's like that is just gardening. Like you're going to kill things. You're going to like think you're doing this beautiful design and it looks terrible. And I think it's just, it's a forgiving field because oh, winter comes, it's going to kill everything anyway and just try again the next year. And mm-hmm. whether you're just gardening in a, in a couple pots at your house or you're volunteering at a garden somewhere, just get involved. I think a lot of people feel relief to know that you've also killed house plants. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm really bad with um, uh, snake plants, those like tall mm-hmm. striped ones. I killed I... my snake plant too, and it makes yeah. me feel so bad because everyone says that they're the easiest to grow. <laughs> right? I'm like, how do I not do this right? I have everything else. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big project that Caroline and I were doing right before the pandemic, um, we were working on the Great Indoors exhibit at MPG, and like our mission was to tell people that like you can grow a house plant and like this is how you can do it and like just try again and like both of us care so much about that because like being in college and especially now there seems to be a huge trend of like filling your home and house or the place you live or the place you work with plants um but people are like oh well I kill them so I guess I just have to give up now and like I guess I'm not good at plants because, you know, there's the whole like green thumb thing. Oh, I guess I just like it, it must be me, you know, and I guess to maybe some extent education is important and maybe do some research on how to take care of that specific plant. But also it's just, you know, plants aren't perfect, so things will happen. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just knowing that you can mess up. Right. Yeah. And who cares? <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's not just a plant, but it's just a plant. Like, come yeah. on. It, it's okay. So just like, how would you sum up horticulture for people who might see that term as, I don't know, something that they don't really know that much about? That is probably the toughest question in terms of, in terms of like why I'm so passionate about trying to get people to care about plants. 
and it's horticulture it's also botany you know people confuse mm-hmm. those two terms all the time like i've been called a botanist and i'm like i'm very much not a botanist like i think it's just like it's moving away from the formality that is usually associated with gardening um, and embracing more of like the messiness of it. One thing I'm trying to brace myself as like working for the Smithsonian is I think the name Smithsonian carries so much weight as like this formal institution, you know, we're like the pinnacle of education and knowledge. So we have an expectation to do everything the right way, the best way. And I think that can get in the way of doing things a messier way. Like, do we need to um, rake up all the leaves every year and then blow in dyed hardwood mulch? And it's, it's, it's a cultural thing that like a lot of horticulture is embedded in this like older practice with a lot of older folks just in general, I mean, like, people who are gardeners are gardeners for a lifetime, usually. What I've noticed, too, is people come out of the woodworks on Instagram to, like, ask questions. And I think it's, and a lot of people are like, wow, I've, like, never thought of this. Or I've seen this flower outside my apartment every day, and I never knew what it was called. And, like, that is a a win for me. It really is. Um, And just making volunteering more accessible. Like, that's why last summer when I brought my friends down to City Hall, I was like, bring anyone you want. Like, I don't care if you've never touched a plant before. Like, we will find a place for you to fit in. I love that you use, like, your personal platform to talk about this. Because I think when people see, well, at least when I see other passionate people, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And then I take the time to read it, kind of no matter what what the topic is yeah it's just great to hear um from other passionate people so to anyone who's listening phil needs you (laughs) (laughs) join phil (laughs) yeah we all we all need you i mean the world the world needs us because you know the planet and the plants want it it's all we have and they they can easily just not be here and we lose species every day and Plants don't have the PR that animals do. If you hear that the pandas are going extinct, everyone's going to be like, not the pandas. But like we lose plant species by like the tens, if not hundreds every single day. Mm -hmm. And there's just not like a care enough or like money behind botany programs to like go conserve these species and things like that. Yeah. And I feel like it's like one of the most hands on past you could take if like sustainability has been such a big thing in recent years like I know I took AP environmental science in high school and like everyone was really interested like reducing reusing recycling all that kind of stuff but like it doesn't really like that like horticulture and gardening is such like a small thing that you can do that really changes stuff but besides like environmental science we didn't have any like botany programs any horticulture programs in my high school and I almost wish that we did because I feel like a lot more people would have been interested in it. When you can tell powerful stories about plants through a human framework, that's like what sells them. And, you know, right now I'm, I'm writing up a lot of Instagram posts for native plant month that you'll see on the, the Smithsonian gardens page. And if I was just like, Betula nigra is a native plant that is a, you know, birch tree that grows next to rivers. Like, if that was all I said about it, no one is going to care. And it's like, how have, you know, river birches been used in eastern North America for hundreds, if not thousands of years? It's like, who was using them? What are, like, why are they important? What are, you know, those, you just got to do the work. You got to do the research. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what makes my job so multifaceted. And I get to learn about people at the same time. I feel like we could talk forever. Everything no. you said was amazing. No, I'm like looking at my questions. I'm like, I feel like we hit everything, but I still like <laughs> it's like, yeah, we hit everything yet. There's so much to talk about. But hopefully there'll be a season two and we can continue the conversation in season two. Thanks so much, Phil. Yeah, nice to meet you both. Take Bye. care. See you later. Bye. The Garden Gate was created by Kira Burba and Caroline McDonald as part of the Learning by Leading initiative with the Smithsonian Gardens. This team includes Emily Warshaw as the Education Specialist, 
Yena Yu as the marketing specialist, Nicolette Kelly as the recording assistant, and Megan Hasty as the audio engineer. The music is by Royalty Free Music on SoundCloud. Special thanks to Cynthia Brown and Paula Healy. Learn more by visiting gardens.si.edu. Thanks for listening.